Okay, it's one o'clock and good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to the American Flora Endowment Group Pro webinar series. I am your moderator, Lena Layton, and I am a member of AFE's Young Professional Council. I recently graduated with a PhD in plant breeding genomics and genetics from the University of Georgia. And currently I'm an ornamental plant breeder at Spring Meadow Nursery, Premier Winner Color Choice. Today's session is on sensors and advances in technology. On behalf of the environment and the endowment, I'm excited to be part of AFE's Grow, AFE's Grow Pro webinar series that features a new topic every month presented by an industry expert. The webinars are free to every, everyone thanks to the generous sponsors of AFE sponsors. This session is sponsored by Pure Green Farms and Total Grow Lights. Pure Green Farms grows, packs, and ships leafy greens year-round at their hydroponic farm in South Bend, Indiana. They use environmentally friendly practices to produce the highest quality greens through their hands-free, high-tech climate control space. Total Grow Lights delivers the ultimate in horticultural lightning control. Their custom-tailored light spectra and designs, uh, their custom Tailored light spectra and designs provide versatility, precision, efficiency, and uniformity to exceed, exceed the demands of grower and plants. If you'd like to learn more about our sponsors, or if you are a supplier and interested in becoming a sponsor of our topic, you can find that information on AFE website at endowment.org growpro, or click in the link in the chat. Today's session will be presented by, in English by Dr. Krishna Nimali, and after the presentation, we will have time for our Q&A. We encourage you to submit your questions through the Q&A feature or the chat. We'll answer as many of your questions live as we can before the end of the hour. Any unanswered questions may be answered through a separate email exchange following the presentation. This session is being recorded and will be shared to AFE YouTube channel. Through YouTube's accessibility features, you will be able to access closed captions in other languages. Without further ado, I'd like to present today's speaker, Dr. Krishna Nemali. Dr. Nemali joined the Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture at Purdue University in 2016 as an assistant professor and extension specialist. He has a PhD in horticulture for the University of Georgia. His doctoral research focused on the environment and on the development of plant-based automatic automated irrigation techniques using sensors and studies related to the physiological responses of greenhouse grown crops to different levels of light, water, and nitrogen during production. At Purdue, Dr. Nemali has responsibility for extension, research, and teaching activities related to controlled environment agriculture. Dr. Nemali has published nearly 25 scientific articles and 15 expert review extension publications. He has received several federal and industry grants. And recently he received Purdue University Cooperative Extension Specialist Association Early Career Award. Dr. Nemali, welcome and thank you for presenting today on sensors and advanced technology. Dr. Nemali is with us and he has a problems with the camera. So he'll be presenting live, but we were not able to see it. So go ahead, Dr. Nemali, thank you. Thank you, Lena. I really appreciate you for giving me such a nice introduction. I also want to thank American Floral Endowment for giving me this opportunity to share our research on smart sensors. So the topic for today is sensors and advances in technology, especially focusing on smart sensors. The subtopics include importance of plant monitoring, what are the issues with plant monitoring? And then we'll dive into the concept of what are smart sensors, what can be measured using these smart sensors. Finally, I'll describe about how we develop this technology and how we plan to make this technology available to our growers. So I want to start by sharing this slide. And the title clearly explains the situation most of our growers face floriculture growers face in the United States. Resource investment per unit area is very high in floriculture. There are at least uh, one plant occupies in a square foot. 
And then on top of that, in order to maintain optimum environment, we add lighting, supplemental lighting. We turn on uh, automated nutrition and irrigation facilities. We have uh, to add heating, and in some cases, we have to cool the greenhouses. All of those add to operational costs. So on one side, the resource investment per unit here is very high in floriculture. If the plants are not monitored properly, it can result in significant losses in quality and therefore uh, reduction in profits in floriculture. So on one side, we have high investments. On the other side, if you're not careful about monitoring plant growth and quality, it can significantly result in a loss of uh, revenue and, and the growers may not uh, achieve profits in floriculture production. I want to show some examples here. There are three pictures and these pictures are actually uh, shared with me by our growers in, in Indiana. And you can see the picture on the left side. Uh, the grower here uh, is heavily involved in producing plugs. And on one fine day in uh, March, they figured out that the germination percentage is so low that they cannot fill the, uh, meet the demand for the landscapers or for the, for the finishers. Um, so this could have been monitored carefully earlier, and if the problem was detected earlier, perhaps uh, something could have been done. The picture in the middle shows chrysanthemum pots, and you can see some of the pots showing kind of yellowish foliage compared to the green foliage plants just sitting next to these pots. And in this particular case, the grower informed me that there are almost 15 to 20 percent of the plants showing yellowish foliage. Now, by the time this yellow is foliage is seen visually, it's probably too late for this grower to fix this problem. And imagine, usually growers, uh, chrysanthemum growers, they plant almost 200,000 pots in many greenhouses I've seen in Indiana. And imagine 15 to 20 percent of the pots showing discoloration like that. That's a huge loss. Um, poor growth can result in plant growth. If, if you apply plant growth regulators, uh, without uh, uh, proper timing, without monitoring plant growth and apply them too early or too late, uh, it ends up in uh, producing plants that are too short and of poor quality. And that's what I'm showing you in the picture to the right where poinsettia plants as well as zinnia plants are shown. The normal plant and the plant with too much of plant growth regulators is, is shown there. So the bottom line is on one side, um, resource investment is high. On the other side, it is so important to monitor plants in order to make sure that we, uh, the, 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 the floriculture production is profitable. So what's the challenge with plant monitoring? Um, well, there are many plant monitoring techniques available for our floriculture growers. Um, here is an example of a standard method. Um, many of our floriculture growers are familiar with pour-through method of measuring substrate electrical conductivity or substrate fertilizer status. Um, the process is very well established. However, there are many steps involved in this process. You have to irrigate the plants and let the plants sit aside, at least the substrate, get equilibrated with, with the added uh, water for at least an hour, and afterwards you have to place some saucers at the bottom of the pots, add a little bit of uh, either RO water or the same fertilizer solution at the top and collect the leachate in saucers, and then pour the leachate into beakers and use uh, an ECPH sensor to measure the electrical conductivity and pH of the substrate. And if you uh, look at the time it takes to, to collect this type of data, um, you know, just from the moment you place the sauces and the moment you collect the leachate and measure EC and pH, it may take almost about five minutes. And imagine you have 100,000 chrysanthemum parts and you wanted at least measure, uh, you know, if, if a, a two or three dozen parts to get a real good estimate of substrate is in pH, it takes a lot of time, it's a lot of labor. So this process is good, however, it takes time and labor and money to do that. Most of our growers use visual assessments. Um, they, they come, they, as they're walking in the greenhouse, they look at the plants and sometimes they notice discoloration on the foliage and that's an indication of some physiological disorder or nutrient disorders uh, seen in plants. Now, there are two issues with visual monitoring. Um, you should be really experienced to correctly detect the issue. Um, you know, if you look at the plant on the right side, you know, I can notice some 
intravenal chlorosis. Some leaves at the top are showing yellowish color. Is it nitrogen deficiency? Is it sulfur deficiency? Is it magnesium deficiency? To get to that level of detail, it really requires a lot of experience. The other problem with visual assessments is by the time you see uh, a damage uh, on the plant, it's probably too late to correct that plant. So therefore, um, experience and also um, probably delay in, in correction are the two major issues with visual assessments. And if you're not experienced, you can make erroneous mistakes. There is a third method, laboratory assessments, and if you, uh, you probably have sent some samples to the laboratory, and here is an example of uh, a laboratory analysis report I received from plants that were grown in my study, and it gives a, a detailed analysis of different concentration of different elements. Um, uh, content, uh, content wise, the, uh, what percentage of the plant tissue contains uh, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, other elements uh, are present in the plant. And this is a very good piece of information. You can take this information and fine tune your fertilizer guidelines based on the percentage of nitrogen or other elements present in the plant. Again, same issues with this procedure. You have to collect samples, that's labor. And then after you collect samples, some of the processing needs to be done. You have to dry the samples kind of convert them into a powdery form, and then ship them to a laboratory. A laboratory will analyze within five to seven days and send the sample results back to you. And, and sometimes it may cost 15 to $20 per sample. So it, there's a cost involved, there's a time factor involved. And in floriculture production, you really don't want to wait for a week to make a decision on whether I should increase the fertilizer concentration or should lower the fertilizer concentration or to figure out what's going on with the plants. So that's, that's another major challenge. There are some sensors that can give instantaneous data on uh, plant nutrient status or plant growth or temperature of the plant. So you can use these sensors to adjust uh, environmental conditions. Uh, you can adjust the fertilizer uh, concentration that you're supplying to plants. But then the problem with this method is these sensors are expensive. They are about $1,000 at a minimum for a canopy temperature sensor. Uh, this pad meter that we normally use in academic research, uh, it's sort of like a surrogate for plant nitrogen content. It's about $2,500. And uh, some of the other equipment that can provide more information about plant growth and other things associated with plants, like hyperspectral cameras, they are even much more expensive. Some of them are like fifteen to $20,000. So up to this point, I mentioned three things. Um, a, and I, I started describing that resource investment is very high. Therefore, it's critical that plants need to be monitored carefully, carefully to stay in business and achieve profits in floriculture production. And then, then I mentioned that in order to monitor plants, there are several techniques available, but then each and every technique has some challenges, some issues. Some of the techniques either are expensive, some are time consuming, some are labor intensive, and some, some of them um, can be cumbersome, tedious. So keeping all these things in mind at Purdue University, we've been thinking about ways to make plant monitoring and floriculture really easy so our growers can uh, really take the advantage of uh, uh, high quality plant monitoring techniques using using some smart sensors. So so what is a smart sensor? A smart sensor monitors plants many traits, you know, whether it's fertilizer, growth, color. I'm going to share some examples in the next few slides. But it 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 captures plant images. So you can capture an image with a phone, a mobile phone, a smartphone that you have, or you can also capture these images with low cost devices like the IoT sensor I'm showing you in this picture, this is approximately $150, and that IoT sensor talks to your smartphone. So you can see the pictures of the plants. There's a tiny camera at the top that captures the images and sends those images to your phone or to your computer. And once these uh, images uh, are, are received by the computer or the phone, they get processed, and immediately within a few seconds, uh, you can see useful information about size of the plant, in some cases nitrogen status of the plant, germination counts, um, and many other many other economically important traits. The nice thing about these smart sensors, they're A, low cost, um, and B, they're very easy to use. It's like using a phone and capturing a picture on your phone. And because of these two reasons, they're 
very attractive to our growers. And we think that these smart sensors are easily adapted by our growers. And the last but not the least, especially in this pandemic era, there's been a, a huge problem in the floriculture industry. Um, the, the trained workforce has been an issue, has been a challenge from the beginning, but with the pandemic, the problem has significantly increased. Uh, there is a, a limited trained workforce available in floriculture industry. So these sensors can actually train untrained workforce, and uh, they can actually use these sensors on their phones to determine exactly what's happening with these plants. So there's a lot of nice things about these smart sensors. And you can see here at the bottom, uh, this, this IoT sensor, which is about $150, it can be placed about, about a tray of, here in this case, poinsettia plants. It takes the picture of the plants. Now, you're not measuring just one plant. You're measuring groups of plants, and then you can collect data on these plants. And if you take pictures continuously, you can have a continuous track of data. So I'm going to share uh, some of the examples of uh, applications, different applications that are possible using these smart sensors. Um, the first application is monitoring growth. Monitoring growth is critical in any business, uh, uh, not just the floriculture crop, but it's even more important in floriculture crops. So by growth monitoring, I'm referring to tracking how the plants are growing with time. So it, you can monitor plant growth many ways. You can cut the plants and weigh the plants, but that's a destructive harvest and it's not preferred by many growers. You can measure the height of the plants, and then you can track the height of the plants, and that kind of gives a, an indirect estimate of how the plants are growing. Um, and later on, I'll show you an example of how that height is used um, in poinsettia production. But then you can also measure the top-down area. Uh, it's called canopy area. It's the area of the leaves. And this measurement, area, leaf area, that's measured top-down, what we call as canopy area, is linearly related to the size and weight of the plants. So this particular application is about measuring that canopy area using smartphones. Just a picture can be taken using a phone, and within a few seconds, you can get the top-down area of the plant, a very accurate uh, area of the top-down canopy area of the plant. In this picture, I'm showing you the original image that was taken by the smartphone, and you can see there is a small red square. That red square is a standard. We tell the software that red square is approximately certain area. Use that information. Now calculate the green area in this image and use the information in the red square to actually convert the green pixel area into actual canopy area. And so you can see here the picture was taken and the picture was processed on the next slide. And from that, the software quickly provided a number in this particular case, 2,934 centimeters square is the area of all those seedlings in that particular plant. Now, if you measure this every day for the next seven or eight days, that canopy area is going to increase as these plants are becoming bigger and bigger, and you can actually use this information. Actually, the software plots the data onto an Excel file. You can actually see, the, uh, you can actually track the growth of the plants. You can compare that growth with the standard growth curves, if you, have, if you develop this type of information for different species, you can always compare the growth of a particular set of plants with standard curves. And from that, you can see whether the plants are growing the way you expect them to grow, if they're going faster or slower. And from that information, you can adjust and figure out what's going wrong with the plants if they are growing slower than the expected rate. So that's a nice thing about this growth tracking. And, and this growth tracking uh, information actually is, is we, we have done a lot of experimentation where we actually take images just like the one I described with the smartphone. That is what we call as estimated area. But then we also take the same plants, run them through standard laboratory equipment, like in this case, a leaf area meter, um, where the leaves are run through rollers and we actually get a very accurate information about the leaf area. And we compare how the smartphone estimated area relates to laboratory measured leaf area. In this case, you can see many species of plants are shown in this graph, and we see that regardless of species, the smart, smartphone measured canopy area is tightly related, nearly one-to-one -one relationship with actually laboratory measured area. Okay, So that's a nice application. The second application, which is actually even more popular, I get a lot more uh, questions and, and uh, uh, about this particular application is actually measuring the nitrogen status of plants. Nitrogen is an important element. 
nitrogen affects crop growth and quality, especially floriculture crop growth and quality. It is so important to make sure that the percentage of nitrogen in the leaf is at in the optimum range. Usually it is in anywhere between three to four percent in floriculture production, but you got to make sure that the nitrogen content of the crop is in that range. In fact, Fertilizer programs based on leaf nitrogen content are the most effective way of growing plants. And so in order to get this type of information, the available method is you take a sample of a leaf and you send it to a laboratory. And within a week or so, after spending $15 to $20 per sample and, and you know, dozens of samples need to probably need to be sent to laboratory, after a week or so, you get the information. So it's, there's a time delay and cost associated with that. But here is an example of salvia plant. I took the image of the salvia plant using my smartphone, and we segment the plant, and we look at how much of the light is being absorbed in the red, green, and blue wave bands. Remember, red, green, and blue wave, light, light wavelengths are absorbed by plants and photosynthesis. So this measurement is tied to plant physiology. It's not a random number. It's tied to plant physiology. We develop algorithms based on how much of the light is being absorbed by these different wavelengths. And from that, we develop something called a nitrogen index. So this is not nitrogen content in plants, but this particular measurement is tightly related to nitrogen content. I'm going to show you some examples here. You can see, let's focus on this right side graph to start with, and then we can talk about the left side graph. You see here the nitrogen index is shown on the x-axis, and the laboratory measured nitrogen content is shown on the y-axis. And this data is coming from four different bedding plant species, impatiens, marigolds, salvia, and zinnia. We wanted to see... Uh, what happens when we pull all the data from different species together? And what we are seeing is even when we pull all species together, there is a reasonably good relationship between nitrogen content measured in the laboratory and that nitrogen index measured by the smartphone. Just a click of, uh, you know, take a picture, and then you get this nitrogen index on, on the smartphone. And, and the, with, with the accuracy is about 70% in this case. But then the accuracy significantly increases to almost 80 to 85% when you plot these graphs on a species level. Uh, if you just look at impatience or marigold per se, it is even much more tighter. So that's one nice thing. Now we can get that measurement, amount of nitrogen in the plant, on your smartphone very quickly within a few seconds. We also compare that nitrogen index with the academic standard, something like a SPAD me measurement that is commonly used in academic research. And these two in uh, measurements also appear to be nicely correlated with almost an R square of 0.7 for all four species. Again, this correlation goes really high if you look at one species at a time. But uh, even regardless of the species, we are seeing that this measurement ha is, is tightly related to laboratory measured uh, nitrogen content as well as SPAD measurement. So here I'm showing you that with just a smartphone, a quick measurement with a smartphone, you can get information nearly as accurate as what you get from a laboratory analysis or using expensive equipment like a SPAD meter. Few other applications, germination percentage, and, and this measurement is very important for seed companies or for plug producers. You, the, you ha want to make sure that the germination percentage in trace is very close to more than 95%. And if you are a plug producer and if you have hundreds and hundreds of trays, you know, it's really impossible to manually get an estimate of germination percentage in trays. It is a picture of a tray. I just took a picture of that using a smartphone. And within seconds, the smartphone calculates the number of seedlings that are germinated in this tray. In this particular case, these are marigold seedlings. And you can see this the tray has about 86% of seedlings germinated. This is another huge benefit, especially to, to seed companies and plug producers. Um, you can also get the uh, count on number of flowers that can be harvested in a given day. Um, it, it's say, similar to the seed co seedling count, but in this case, you're counting the flowers. You take a picture, and in this case, these are anthurium cut flowers, and you can take a picture of a group of plants within a known area, and within a few seconds, you know how many flowers are there. And from that, you can kind of estimate the number of flowers that can be harvested on any given day. There's also another useful uh, measurement in floriculture production. Um, plant height and width, very important measurement for plant growth regulator application, PGR application. Um, think about crop like poinsettias. You want to make sure that you apply PGRs when plants are actively growing. You don't want to apply them before or late, right? And in order to 
target plant growth regular application or growers, what they normally do is they take a roller, and I have seen this with my own eyes, they actually take a roller and they measure the height of poinsettia plants and they track that height on a, on a piece of paper. So they know that when the plants get to a certain height, they can hit the plants with plant growth regulator. But then that is again labor intensive. You got to go to a plant, put a roller, make a measurement, record it. And here is a picture again with a smartphone. I've taken now the image sideways and within a second, I get the height and width of this point set plant. Not just that, that data is now added onto an Excel file and it actually starts showing nice plots. And so you can actually target, you can actually measure many, many more plants with this technique. That's the advantage. I mean, you can do manually, but with manual measurements, you're limited to number of plants. But then with this type of technology, you can actually get more measurements. Hundreds and hundreds of plants can be measured. More data means more accuracy. That's where the power of this technology is. On top of that, this is the power in your pockets, in your hands, right? So that's another nice advantage with this smart technology. I also want to take a few more minutes to explain how we develop this technology. Now, there's a lot of research goes into bringing up this technology to our growers. We conduct actually scientific scale experiments, replicated trials, where we subject plants to different levels of uh, fertilizers and from each plant we sample leaves, we send them to laboratory, we measure uh, the nitrogen status of different elements in the plant in laboratory, we run, we measure the weight of the plants, we track the growth of the plants, but then we also collect these images. Initially we start using some uh, high expensive multi-spectral image stations and we figure out what particular wavelengths are needed to estimate a particular economically useful trait. Once we know that, we build custom build some of those IoT sensors or custom build the software that we need to uh, add on to our smartphones and then bring that technology to our growers. So by the time our growers see this, is a lot of research that's already happened on the on that particular uh, application. You see here uh, an example of uh, how we process images. None of this is actually seen by our, our, our clients, but these things happen at the background. When we take a picture and from that point onwards, the, when the picture is processed, there are so many steps. We have to make sure that the background, like the part and the substrate that are already included in the picture, they're taken away and we're only carefully measuring the traits related to plants. And, and not the background. And for that, we actually run through sophisticated software programming before we actually use these images and develop some useful information from those images. So now the last part, how are we going to make this technology available to our growers? And this is one question I get whenever I share this technology with growers at conferences. So what is going to happen is, we're going to develop two types of technologies. One is that handheld unit I've shown you. It's about $150, and these units can be mounted on top of the plants, and you can leave these units on top of the plants in a greenhouse. And those units will talk to, uh, if they're connected to the network, they will send images to a computer, and on the computer, all the magic can happen on your computers. And end of the day, you will see Excel files with nice graphs. All that information will be automatically stored. So that is one piece of uh, technology that we are developing, and we are going to make that available the other piece of technology that we're making available is even much more easier. That's directly on your phones. So there is going to be an app that we're going to release, and this app will come out sometime summer, uh, spring or summer of 2022. And the name of the app is called Aptus, A-P-T-U-S. Okay? And that's an acronym. It stands for, right at the bottom, you can see Aptus stands for Analyzing Plant Traits Using Smartphones. Okay? It's a Latin word. Aptus means apt, appropriate. So what happens is when you, when you, um, the app is going to be, need to be purchased for a, a, a minor fees. And we, we are requesting our, uh, some, some license fees here to enable us continue this research, develop much more traits of economic importance to our growers. And that's the reason why we're going to make, uh, license this on an annual basis to our growers, but it will be a, a small, amount of money that a, a, a tiny portion of the money that you normally spend on sampling but imagine how many hundreds and hundreds of times you can use this app on on a daily basis so basically once you have this app on your phones you can download it on android and ios devices you click on that app it will ask you to select a crop and you we have developed algorithms species specific algorithms so you can select poinsettias zinnias hydrangeas marigolds like that 
And then once you select the crop, then it's going to ask whether there is an interest in measuring nitrogen status of the plants, is an interest in measuring number of seedlings, or is there interest in measuring the area of the plant, track the growth of the plant. All those applications are available. You can select one application, and then minor instructions will show up how to place a camera for the plants, at what height one should place a camera, and at what angle the camera should be placed, uh, the phone should be placed in this case. And then afterwards, you just take a picture. Once you take a picture, what happens is the picture from your devices comes to a web server maintained at Purdue University. So each of our clients, if you purchase a license, you will also have a username and password. So your information is very secure. And the images come in a secure path to Purdue University's web server. And on that web server, the images will be processed. And within a few seconds, not more than a minute, all those processed information comes back to your device, a mobile device with a smartphone or an iPad or a computer. And when it comes back, you can see the nitrogen content, you can see the area of the plants, whatever you, have, uh, you ask the software to do for you. So this is how we wanted to run this application. And like I said, again, the app name is Aptus. And if you're interested in that handheld unit that you want to place above plants, you can reach, you can reach us and we'll be able to help you with, with that as well. Um, now, the, the last bit of information, if you're really interested how this app actually works, uh, there is a demonstration on my website at Purdue University. Here is a link. Uh, I think this link will be available to you when, when you get the copy of this presentation. All you need to do is click on that link and find, uh, you, will, you will see a, a phone and just click uh, uh, the, the arrow that you see there and automatically there is a, a short three minute video that shows how easy it is to actually capture a picture and then get the information about plant nitrogen index and also the canopy area. So just a, a nice demonstration there. And I, I recommend you to actually go to this site and see the demonstration. With that, I, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, end my presentation. Be and before I want to do uh, end my presentation, I want to again thank American Floral Endowment for giving me this opportunity and funding this research for the last three years. Um, and we continue to do this research and we continue to make more and more traits available on smartphones for our floriculture growers. I also want to acknowledge and our sponsors, Total Grow and Pure Green Farms. Both companies have been heavily involved in supporting my research at Purdue University. And, um, and I really thank them for the continued support they have provided to my research. Uh, with that, I will end this presentation. And, and if there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Rimali. It was extremely informative. I would like to open now the session for Q&A. So if you have any question, please submit it through the chat or through the Q&A uh, option in this webinar. So while we wait for people to submit their questions, I have one. And this can be like a very basic question, but how accurate the, the smart sensors can measure, for example, nitrogen, the nitrogen status of a plant? Correct. Um, it, it, is a, it is a great question, Leonard. And, and the most accurate method of determining nitrogen content is a laboratory method, right? So just please keep that in mind. Uh, and that is still the standard method. Then I have shown you a graph where we have about four or five different species uh, studied in this particular experiment. And I have actually data from other species like poinsettias, hydrangeas as, as well. But collectively, when we look at all these different species, we see that the accuracy of nitrogen status measurement is in the range of 75 to 80%. Now, if you, if you dial into the algorithms that are species specific, the accuracy further increases to almost 80%. So, so that is a, a, a really good level of accuracy for an instantaneous measurement. And if you are you know, measuring the nitrogen content at, at, at that level of accuracy, you, know, you should be able to uh, have a good handle on fertilizer management in, in greenhouses. Thank you for asking that question. Yeah, I have another question. Uh, is, is this technology species specific, meaning that you have to develop a new model for each specific species, or, can, or you can use it in different uh, species that they are not like that you haven't tested before? 
Yeah, again, a good question. Uh, so that we actually, when we run our experimentation, when we develop these algorithms, we actually start with species-specific algorithms because we have run uh, experiments with, with the different species anyway, so we have collected data at a species level. But then our ultimate goal is to see if we can come up with sort of like a universal uh, calibration for all bedding plants, at least at a bedding plant species level, or for you know uh, container plants. Um, we try to do that, and what we see is that um, you know sometimes um, you know we can group them, like I've shown you the example of four different bedding plant species. But other times we may not be able to. Um, but for accuracy's sake, it may be actually better to actually use the species-specific algorithm. I mean, the, uh, the work has already been done. It's a matter of selecting a specific species. And, and collecting that type of information. Uh, yes, the, so to answer your question, we we uh, we actually want to collect data at a sp species level, um, and then we try to pull species together to see if we can actually do that. Otherwise, we do not. We just leave the option to our growers. Yeah, thanks. There is something uh, a little bit related with that. We have a question in the chat that said, is there a crop selection for lettuce varieties? Um, is is there a, a a crop selection? I think I think in your talk you in your talk you said that in in the app it will be like a drop down menu for the different species. I think the question is related if there is any specific just for lettuce because of the different varieties that lettuce. Sure, sure. So so a great question again. And uh, by the way, uh, I have both uh, hydroponics and floriculture research in my program, and so we've been doing similar research for lettuce as well. And we have actually developed similar models, crop growth, nitrogen status, all those traits for lettuce as well. And we see actually even much tighter relationship in the case of lettuce. Uh, we have uh, grouped together varieties that belong to leaf lettuce group into one bucket. We have algorithms for romaine lettuce in another bucket. We have algorithms for butterhead lettuce in another bucket. Likewise, we have algorithms for different groups. And within groups, we already worked on two or three varieties. So that data is already there. I'm not presenting today because this is for our uh, flower growers. But if there is an interest on lettuce, please do reach me and I can uh, uh, discuss about that. Okay, great. Uh... It seems that there are no more questions, but I have a last question. It is, uh, can people be, became a, a, an early adopter of this technology? And if so, how, what is the process? Do they need to contact you? Do they need to sign up in our website? How, how is the process? Yeah, I, yes, uh, we are actually starting to collect uh, uh, register people who wants to adopt this uh, you know, early. Uh, like I said, uh, you know, in spring or summer of next year, when we open up this, uh, this app, what I really want to do is before that happens, I wanted to work with some early adapters. So just to get some feedback from them and using that feedback, we wanted to optimize the product further. And so if there is anyone interested uh, to become an early adapter of this technology, uh, if they are willing to share their, their information with us, I'll be more than happy to work with them and we'll provide these apps to them and we can, uh, we can work with them and we can try to get their feedback and optimize this product. So the best way to do this is email me, knimali at purdue.edu, and we will reach to you uh, in, in January, February timeframe, and we'll plan um, to, to work with you and collect some data. All right, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Nimali. And with that, I would like to thank everybody for joining us today for another session of AFE Grow Pro webinar series. We we'll encourage you to view our full, our full calendar at endowment.org slash growpro. While you're there, check out our past webinar recordings, other grower-related resources, and research reports available to you for free, thanks to industry support. Our next webinar will be Care and Handling, Sell the Highest Quality and long, Longest Lasting Cut Flowers on November 9th at 1 p.m. Eastern. We ask you that please complete the brief survey about today's session because your feedback will be will help us to continue to improve the monthly webinars and provide additional topics of importance. Thank you so much for joining us today and you have a great day.